the first of the 2020 UG Memorial Pensions Lectures. This is the sixth year we have been running this series and I hope you'll agree that we've put together another excellent set of lectures this year. I will say something about the other talks in the series right at the end. But today, as you know, the obviously very topical subject is requests for contribution breaks. First, Francesca Mitchell and Simon Atkinson will approach the matter from the perspective of trustees. And then in the second half of today's event, Tom Robinson will address the topic from the perspective of employers. We'll see how time goes, but we might have a pause to address questions after Francesca and Simon have spoken. And then again, hopefully, there will be the opportunity to address further questions after Tom has completed his presentation. I've been told to say in relation to questions that if you do wish to raise one, please do not use the chat function for this, but press the Q&A button and tap in your question in the box that then appears. You can do this at any time during the talks and the questions are fed through to the presenting team. I'm also told that there's an option within the Q&A function uh, uh, of to, to raise your question anonymously, uh, though I should say that one possible advantage of revealing your identity is that if the speakers aren't able to respond live, but we know who you are, we'll be able to contact you, off, contact you afterwards with a response over the next couple of days or so. So without further ado, I will at this point hand over to Francesca. Thanks, James. So, before Simon takes you through the three Ps, powers, persuasion and penalties, I'm going to briefly talk to you about uh, some of the recent guidance. So as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of very helpful material has been produced, particularly by the pensions regulator on the issues that have arisen during the pandemic. I'm going to focus on just three aspects of the guidance for trustees. First, responding to requests for easements in defined benefit schemes. Second, regarding requests for a reduction in contributions in defined contribution schemes. And third, the TPR easements on reporting duties and its enforcement activities. So firstly then, how to handle employers' requests for easements in DB schemes. Now the main piece of guidance is called DB Scheme Funding and Investment COVID-19 Guidance for Trustees and it was published on the 27th of March. But first and foremost from this guidance is that trustees should be open to requests to reduce or suspend deficit repair contributions, providing that they keep in mind a number of key principles, including first understanding the employer's cash flow and the drivers behind the request. There's also an additional piece of guidance which suggests a number of probing questions uh, to help elicit this information from the employer. Second, trustees must ensure that no payments or dividends are paid to related entities or shareholders, i.e. ensure that the scheme is not being shortchanged, although in uh, so extraordinary or essential intra-group payments or lending might be justifiable in exceptional circumstances. Third, the trustee should ensure that other creditors and also lenders are being generally supportive. Fourth, any suspension should have a specified end date and also a trigger a restart if and hopefully when trading returns to normal. Fifth, the trustee should only be considering short periods of suspension. And in this regard, the TPR has provided further guidance as to circumstances where sufficient information is not available to make a fully informed decision, then the trustees should agree to request for as short a period as possible, but no longer than three months. And a condition of any agreement should be that full and ongoing provision of information is provided by the employer. In any event, as I say, concessions should be for a short period only, i.e. three months, although further extensions might be appropriate where other creditors are committed to supporting the employer for longer and the three-month restriction by the trustees might limit that support. 
the TPR makes it clear that any release of security is unlikely to be in the member's best interests. But on the other hand, if other parties or other creditors are strengthening their access to the employer's assets through new security, then the trustees must also ensure that the scheme is given a fair share of that new security. The trustees should, of course, take legal and actuarial advice, including um, so not only on whether a suspension or reduction of DRCs is appropriate, but also on the most appropriate method for doing so. So, for example, by amending the schedule of contributions or simply by suspending payments without amendment in order to avoid an unintended consequence like triggering a winding up. The contributions should be repaid within the current recovery plan and the current time frame should not be lengthened under, unless there is sufficiently reliable covenant visibility or, for example, if the existing recovery plan is very short. So clearly the TPR cannot waive trustees statutory obligations, but it will not take regulatory action in respect of late reporting or a failure to make contributions during the three month period. And lastly, the same considerations should apply to any request to suspend or reduce future service contributions. So the second area then for today, the TPR has recognised that some employers may understandably be struggling to make their pensions contributions and they have issued guidance specifically for employers on that, but they've also issued guidance for the trustees. This is called DC Management and Investment COVID-19 Guidance for Trustees and it was updated on the 21st of May. So if employers are paying more than the 3% auto enrollment contribution, excess will not be funded by the coronavirus job retention scheme. And so the employer may want to reduce its contributions. Whether it can do so will also depend on the employment contracts and the terms governing the pension scheme. And it may also require approval of the employees themselves, possibly a trade union and the trustees. But if this is the case and the employer wants to reduce their contribution to the statutory minimum, they can only do so if they don't breach the auto enrollment requirements and they will need to consider other factors such as whether they'll need to change the scheme rules or whether consultation is necessary. So in relation to consultation, employers with at least 50 members are legally required to consult for a minimum of 60 days if they are decreasing employer contributions. However, the TPR has eased the regulatory actions if the employer fails to consult for the full day, full 60 day period, provided uh, so subject to certain conditions. The main condition is essentially that the proposed reduction is only in relation to furloughed staff. So if the employer wanted to reduce contributions for other members of staff, they would still be required to consult for nine weeks or more. Um, if a change to the scheme rules is required, the power to do this could rest with the trustees, it could rest with the employer or be shared between them and it would depend of course on the individual scheme rules. If the power is with the trustees, they will need to make sure that the decision is taken in the best interests of the members. So although the employer is not an object of the trustees' powers, the trustees can nonetheless consider the likelihood of the employer being able to continue as a going concern if it continues to pay the current rate of contributions. However, the risk must be genuine and trustees should consider whether any change should be temporary. If the power rests solely with the employer, then the employer should nonetheless notify trustees before making any changes. So the third area of guidance just for today's talk is the TPR's easements on reporting duties and enforcement activities. Firstly, in relation to reporting, the TPR has said that one, if the breach will be rectified within a short time frame, again, not more than three months, and two, if it does not have a negative impact on savers, then there is no need to report it to the TPR, but trustees should keep records of any decisions they make and of any action taken. Secondly, then, in relation to enforcement, the TPR has made it clear that they will make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and adopt a flexible approach, i.e. they will grant longer periods for compliance and they will take the impact of COVID-19 into account. Finally, the Ombudsman has confirmed that it will take into account all of the TPR guidance if it's receives any complaint about delays. And although at the moment these easements are only in place until the end of the month, the TPR has said that it will review whether other flexibilities or restrictions are required and whether these easements should be extended beyond the 30th of June. So we will have to wait and see what further steps the TPR takes.
And on that note, I will hand over to Simon. Thank you very much, Francesca. Now let me just share my screen and hopefully, So as um, Francesca indicated, I was going to address uh, three principal issues that I think uh, face trustees in the current uh, climate and in the best uh, alliterative traditions of um, advocacy. I have termed them all uh, beginning with P. They are powers, persuasion and penalties. Uh, powers, what can or should trustees do? Persuasion, how do you deal with employers and members? And penalties, what could possibly go wrong with agreeing to contribution holidays or reductions. So um, starting uh, with powers, uh, we have to go to the, uh, the starting point, which is of course the, uh, the trustees, the trust deed and rules. The first question the trustees must always be, uh, what is within the scope of their powers as set out in the governing documentation? Now, of course, in the context of defined benefit schemes, um, requests for contributions, suspensions or reductions for uh, deficit repair contributions are unlikely to present uh, too much of a problem from, from this uh, perspective. As we know, uh, amounts to be paid by scheme employers fluctuate depending on um, that which is agreed under the schedule of contributions and trustees or employers are obviously very experienced in negotiating these uh, from time to time as required. Now, obviously, when um, what's actually going to be requested is potentially a, a reduction uh, in relation to uh, future service contributions, then, of course, that might be more problematical because the trustee and rules may well specify the rates which are to be, uh, uh, to be applied. And if so, of course, a, a scheme amendment may be uh, required. And equally in the context of defined contribution schemes, uh, this may be a particular problem where um, uh, contribution reductions are, are being sought down to the statutory minimum 3%. Now, again, the scheme documentation may uh, specify a, a higher percentage. And so, of course, a, a, an amendment may be uh, required to achieve a reduction. Now, of course, uh, that then leads on to the question, well, uh, if, if the power it does does not presently exist under the scheme rules uh, to agree contribution reductions or holidays um, but there is an amendment power can and should the trustees if, if that power is vested either jointly or singly in the trustees should the trustees uh, accede to that uh, request by amending uh, the scheme rules accordingly now um, i'll come on to the question in a moment as to whether it would be appropriate to do so um, but for the moment, I, I simply flag that obviously it's a, a question as to whether uh, there is the power to amend. Uh, but before one gets on to uh, the question of whether one should amend, it's also imperative to check not just the provisions regarding uh, contribution rates and amendment powers, but also to see uh, what the, the general uh, uh, provisions under the deed and rules are regarding uh, contributions more widely, because what one doesn't want to do is agree some course, of act, uh, some course of action with the employer, which might have unintended consequences, the oops effect. Uh, one doesn't wish to uh, agree uh, contribution reductions or, or holidays, which might have the effect of triggering a partial uh, or full winding up of the scheme, uh, or indeed a, a deemed employer withdrawal uh, event from a multi-employer scheme. So it's absolutely imperative to see uh, what it is you are, um, what it is uh, that is being requested, and how that impacts the scheme more widely. And of course, uh, once those matters have been taken into consideration, and you're satisfied, the trust is satisfied that they they can uh, amend the scheme rules if that's required. We then come on to the question as to whether they should do that. Uh, so, uh, and this is um, the next uh, bullet point on my uh, in my slides, which I've flagged as a fraud on a power or the proper purposes doctrine. Because of course, just because the trustees have the power to do something doesn't mean they should do it. And of course, if they exercise a power for an improper purpose, then that will be a, a breach of their duties. Now, I've, I've identified a couple of recent-ish cases uh, on, on the doctrine of proper purpose. Uh, they don't arise, obviously, in the specific context of, of request for contribution holidays, but they are uh, pensions cases. And in the MNRPF case, it's notable that in, in that case, um, uh, Mr. Justice Asplin said that it is permissible, or it may be permissible and appropriate to take into consideration the interests of the employer when exercising power, provided the primary purpose of securing the benefits due under the rules is furthered by the exercise of that power. So of course, in the particular context of a, a request for a contribution holiday, 
uh, or, or, or reduction, where it's a genuine request, where the employer is obviously uh, in, in some financial distress, then one can see obviously an argument um, in principle that agreeing some sort of reduction or holiday might well be in the best interest of the members if it allows the employer to trade through these difficult times. Uh, but of course, uh, that's not the end of the, the, the question, because of course, uh, there may need to be a, a, a a particular mechanism uh, which is uh, considered in some detail as to how to achieve that. So, for example, uh, where you have schedules of contributions uh, which have been agreed between the employer and the trustees, well, under the uh, Pensions Act, uh, the, the actuary has to sign off, uh, has to certify uh, those schedules of contributions and indeed any revised schedule of contributions. So if uh, what is being proposed is that the, there is some um, uh, change to the schedule of contributions, then at one, then the trustees may well need before they before they take a final decision as to as to whether to accede to this request to seek the input of their actuary. Equally, uh, the trustees may have to have regard to their recovery plan if the scheme is in deficit. Now, uh, it, it's interesting to note that the trust uh, the TPR's guidance on this is that they do expect uh, repayments of any uh, contribution holidays or, or reductions to be made up within an existing recovery plan in most cases. Of course, if the recovery plan is very short, that might not be possible. But certainly TPR's expectation appears to be that um, uh, any underpaid or unpaid contributions uh, which have been agreed should be made up in the existing uh, recovery plan. So these are all issues which the trustees will need to consider when uh, they are considering whether to agree to uh, any um, reduction or, or holiday in contributions. That is, um, that, that's obviously the, the question of powers, but then we have to uh, move on to my second topic, which is uh, persuasion. Now, uh, I, I've termed this uh, persuasion because, of course, the, the, the trustees have on the one hand to uh, negotiate effectively with an employer who approaches them uh, with a request for a contribution break or, or, or a reduction, while at the same time also keeping the membership um, on board so far as may be possible. So sort of caught between uh, these two uh, interest groups, if I can put it that way, the, the, what, what is a trustee to do? Well, focusing uh, firstly on dealing with the employer, how, how should a trustee ap approach um, uh, responding to a request from an employer? Well, it is interesting to note, as Francesca mentioned, that the, the TPR expects trustees to be open to requests for contribution holidays or reductions. But of course, the corollary of a trustee being open to a request is that the employer is also open with the trustees as to why they are seeking that, that request and to provide the necessary information to the trustees to make, uh, so that they can make their decision. So the guidance from TPR is very clear that um, employers should be providing uh, ongoing full information to the trustees. The, trust, uh, the TPR obviously also expects, expects trustees to be robust just because a, a, an employer has come asking for um, a, a concession doesn't mean the trustees should simply roll over because that's what other people are doing or because these, the, the trading times are difficult. Uh, breaks uh, or holidays reductions should be as short as possible. They should be shortened if circumstances permit. And of course, crucially, the pension scheme is just one of several creditors of the employer. And a key question for trustees uh, when negotiating with the employers, well, what are what are the other creditors doing? Uh, one doesn't want to face the situation where, where um, the, the employer is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, it, it is, of course, not unknown uh, for, uh, for some employers to try to do that. And of course, that could be to the prejudice of the scheme. So it is the, the guiding light must always be uh, what is in the best interest of the objects of the trust and, uh, and obviously protecting the position of the pension scheme uh, to, to, uh, as far as possible and considering the other uh, creditors is crucial to that. So that's dealing with the, the employers. Well, what about the membership? Well, of course, trustees are uh, no strangers to active and potentially litigious members. Uh, complaints to the pensions ombudsman and, uh, and now less commonly perhaps court proceedings for breach of trust are, are not unknown, of course, and, and fairly common now in the pensions ombudsman. And members will be looking at their pension pot or the value of the scheme's assets and will be anxious to ensure that any investment losses are recovered and that obviously the employer continues to pay uh, into their funds. Equally, active members will be uh, particularly concerned that the employer remains um, trading. 
So uh, timing may be tight and consultation of the provision of information to members may not always be possible um, immediately, though it is of course generally better to err on the side of openness if that is at all possible. Members will not thank you at later for, for any dealings which they consider to be um, clandestine and unjustified. But um, clearly what, what consultation may be advisable or required will depend upon uh, both what what is being requested by the employer and also whether um, uh, that, that has an impact on the um, in conditions of employment of the of the members. Now clearly if, if there's a question over um, the, the employment conditions that's more likely to be the employer who's fielding those questions but these all feed into the, the, the ultimate question as to uh, what information should be uh, being provided uh, ideally to the membership. Um, and it's also always worth bearing in mind when trustees are considering these issues, the ultimate nightmare scenario. What happens if, if you, the trustees, have agreed your contribution holiday, hoping and believing that the employer is going to trade out of its uh, ride out the storm? Contributions are paused, they might be paused for several months, it might be paused again, but as government support packages wind down, um, then the, the company essentially um, becomes a zombie company for a little while and then goes belly up. Contributions that haven't been made for several months and members have lost jobs, the value of their pension pots have gone down, schemes deficit has ballooned, members are looking for, to scrutinise the trustees' actions. Will the trustees be able to explain why they agreed contribution holidays and the basis on which that decision was made? And waving through a contribution holiday now will look extremely unflattering in the cold light of day in due course. So the bottom line is, uh, keep, uh, take legal advice, uh, take actuarial advice, communication is key. It doesn't necessarily mean that the employer will, that everything will be um, uh, all right in, in uh, the coming months, but at least there will be, um, uh, the trustees will have taken uh, the, the reasonable and proper steps in uh, trying to, to uh, protect the interests of members while also being open to requests for contribution holidays. And briefly and finally, that leads me on to my third uh, and final uh, topic, which was on penalties. And that is really uh, in, in agreeing or considering any of these um, requests, what uh, potentially regulatory issues might be uh, thrown up. Now, I've already flagged that there may be a requirement to take actuarial advice. It's, it's important to remember that under Section 227 of the Pensions Act, uh, that's the, the, the section regarding um, schedules of contributions, which require as actuary, actuarial certification. If trustees fail to take all reasonable steps to secure compliance, then they can be subject to a civil penalty. So it is important to remember that, you, that, that, that um, uh, all reasonable steps are taken uh, to comply with these, these regulatory requirements. Um, other potential um, sections of relevance are Section 40 of the Pensions Act. It might be said that there are certain employer related, um, that, that unpaid employer contributions might be treated as a sort of prohibited investment, but fortunately that's not the case because um, they are actually expressly exempt from the scope of that section by the investment regulations. There is also an open question as to whether um, uh, unpaid, unpaid employer contributions might be an unauthorised employer loan under the Finance Act, Section uh, 179. Um, HMRC's guidance uh, is, is not very clear on this. Uh, HMRC hasn't been quite as um, proactive as TPR in this regard. However, uh, advice from March suggested that arm's length commercial negotiations, including payment holidays on any loans, um, would not trigger an unauthorised payment charge. Now, obviously, that's a slightly different context from, from um, uh, contribution holidays, but it, it certainly suggests that where parties are negotiating um, commercially uh, and, and uh, and are rigorously negotiating, then, then HMRC is going to take a fairly practical and pragmatic line. So um, I, I would suggest watching this space from both HMRC and TPR as matters develop. Um, finally, as, as uh, Francesca noticed, um, TPR is, is likewise taking a flexible and case-by-case -case approach to enforcement, uh, which is obviously welcome in this current crisis. Uh, and that is, uh, brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. So let me stop sharing. I don't know if there are any questions or James, whether you want to uh, uh, deal with that at the end. There are a couple of questions, which I'll, I'll which I think uh, um, for you, Simon, and thank you very much to both Francesca and Simon for those presentations. Um, the first question, not sure if this is capable of a short answer. Uh, the question, um, which is anonymous, is you seem to imply that the regulator view is legally relevant to trustee decision making. 
Yes. Why? Well, why do I think? Well, I, I think uh, TPR's view um, must be legally relevant to trustee decision making. And I think, I think that is so because uh, for, uh, for two reasons. Firstly, in, in these unprecedented times, uh, trustees have to, are, are faced with um, uh, requests coming thick and fast and have to make quick decisions in the best interests of members. And given the, given the novelty of the situation we face, um, a, a, a trustee acting prudently, who, who is under, obviously, um, subject to regulatory um, governance by TPR, um, will, uh, as part of the, their trustee toolkit um, have, uh, and their training, have regard to trustee guidance. And it seems to me that um, ignore uh, the, the, the corollary, the, the, the obverse of not uh, taking into account, um, uh, the, sorry, the corollary of taking into account trustee guidance would, would, would be ignoring trustee guidance. And it seems to me it cannot possibly be right uh, that it would be um, proper for trustees to ignore TPR guidance. So it seems to me it is a legally relevant consideration uh, to review and, and, and take on board trustee guidance, recognising, of course, that it is only guidance. Um, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a prescription. It, it doesn't tell trustees necessarily what they have to do. It is simply guidance. But it seems to me it is a legal, legally relevant consideration because if it weren't, it would be an irrelevant consideration. And I don't see that that would be um, a, a, a um, correct analysis um, having regard to the, the role of the, the regulator and indeed the role of trustees. Um, questions are coming in as we speak. So I'll, I'll, I'll raise one other for you at this point and then perhaps we can pick others up either at the end or, uh, or, or subsequently. Uh, is it best for trustees to implement a delay to deficit repair contributions by amending the schedule of contributions and dealing with that with the regulator or by leaving the contributions unpaid and agreeing some parameters for the recovery of the unpaid sums? I think uh, that there isn't a, a one size fits all answer to that question. I think, I think the reason is that if one simply uh, say paused contributions without amending the schedule of contributions that could depending on the provisions of the trust deed and rules uh trigger or, or risk triggering uh, a wind up because you've essentially got uh the the, the um employer just ceasing uh, contributions in breach of the schedule of uh, in breach of the schedule of contributions um i i i think probably it is better to try and agree in, in most instances it would be better to try and agree an amendment to the schedule of contributions because of that risk but I think one would have to look very carefully at the provisions of the trustee and rules but but recognizing of course that time is quite often of the essence um, but I would err on the side of amending the schedule of contributions in most instances I would think. Thank you very much and um, we're bang on schedule because it's 11 30 and at this point we'll hand over to Tom. Right, thank you everyone. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see a new slide deck and with a bit of luck we can move through it. Um, this part of the talk is looking from the perspective of uh, the employer. Uh, my advocacy skills uh, didn't ever get as far as alliteration. Um, I, I was told uh, lesson one was, well, what do you want and why do you want it? Um, so I'm going to follow that approach, assuming I can get through the slides. Sorry, Oops. there we are. Right. Um, so as I say, what I wanted to start really doing is um, what are the reasons for approaching the scheme? Um, why do I want a contribution holiday? Um, and um, as I said at the bottom of the slide, identifying the reasons um, helps usually shape the strategy. Um, there are perhaps four main reasons. Um, the first is that the scheme's got a very obvious interest in seeing the employer survive. Um, we know that TPR's message for several years now has been the best support for a pension scheme is a strong employer. It's repeating that message in its guidance at the moment. Um, but a, a, on, on top of that, the trustee board's likely to include people with a history of supporting the employer or its group, with knowledge of the employer's business and current employees, so in that sense, too, uh, they may well feel they've got an interest in seeing the employer survive. 
Uh, the second reason is that the business of the employer usually doesn't depend, doesn't need the scheme services, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, um, in order to continue as a going concern. I mean, we can recognize the industrial relations issues, we can recognize other communications issues that need to be managed as part of suspension contributions, but they are of quite a different nature to uh, suspending payments to key suppliers, um, negotiations with lenders. Um, those are likely to be the sources of real new money to fund a restructuring, uh, or simply keep the business trading through what's hoped to be a short-term crisis. So that's reason number two. Uh, reason number three uh, is the scheme can and must take a long-term view. Um, and employers may well consider the scheme can adjust a recovery plan, other income projections, in order to cope with suspensions of contributions uh, in a way that other creditors can't. Uh, and for recovery plans, of course, one has a relatively well-trodden path of, of back-end loading. Um, finally, um, the scheme may well have suffered a lesser impact than the employer uh, over the past few months. Um, of course, that's fact specific. Some schemes will have seen very substantial falls in asset values. Um, some businesses may have seen revenue increase. Uh, but in a number of cases, this is the fourth reason that may lead the employer to turn to the scheme uh, and start thinking about negotiating contribution breaks. Uh, and as I say, I think it's worth uh, starting with a consideration of which of those reasons or others mean the scheme should be asked to assist, because identifying the reasons uh, ought to help shape the strategy. Uh, well, as you've heard, TPR recognised from very early on that requests for contribution breaks may be appropriate reactions to the current situation. Um, but just as Simon and Francesca have said um, for trustees, uh, there are a number of issues for the employer to consider. I've grouped them as follows. Um, firstly, the need to comply with insolvency and associated legislation, um, both as it is now, and also having regard to the new Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Um, secondly, there's the position of TPR and pensions legislation and the Pension Schemes Bill uh, on its way through Parliament. Uh, I use the word on its way through to suggest motion that may be a little, little bit unre unreliable. Um, and, um, and finally, non-statutory considerations. Um, now, I've used those groupings really just to signpost the issues to which directors should have regard when they make decisions about contribution breaks. I mean, they're a guide only. You could probably write a whole book on the issues to which directors must have regard when making decisions in this context, uh, which is a shameless plug. Um, the Non-statutory considerations, though, is where I want to start. Um, and by these, I really mean equitable principles, common law rules, um, and guidance. And really, as, a, as an argument in this talk, because I think I'm allowed to make arguments, I, I want to say that sometimes it's the non-statutory considerations that are the most important when getting the employer where it wants to be in terms of contribution breaks. Um, the three I think are particularly important in this context are firstly, equality is equity, um, secondly, transparency, and thirdly, prudence. Um, equality is equity really sort of underpins the scheme of pari passu distribution once an insolvency process starts. And it's the principle that leads to a need to carefully justify any proposal to treat creditors differently, including the scheme. Um, we've seen that recognised by the courts in the context of CVAs. It's going to be important in the new Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill in the context of restructuring plans. Uh, we know that PPF and TPR have for a long time been concerned to see that in situations of distress, the scheme is treated fairly. Other creditors aren't put in a better position. So one key consideration is how a contribution break fits with dealings with other creditors. And if creditors are being treated differently, there need to be good reasons for that. As I want to say at the end, that doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, there, there may well be very good reasons for differential treatment. And again, the courts have recognized that in the context of CVAs. But as a starting point, as a, as a maxim, equality and is equity is, is quite a good way of approaching this. Um, one factor that may justify treating the scheme differently um, is that it can be offered security or other mitigation to protect its position. 
while contributions break last, contribution breaks last, um, other creditors may not be in the same position. So there are reasons that may justify this. Uh, transparency and provision of information. Well, obviously there are important statutory obligations uh, that govern the provision of information from employers to trustees, scheme admin regs. Um, but I've got in mind here a more general principle. Um, to the extent possible, provide full information to the trustees as to a financial situation of distress and proposals for dealing with it. And you can see the source of this in TPR's guidance, as you've heard from Simon and Francesca. Um, you could also see it as a sensible part of negotiating, or you could probably see it as an aspect of the fiduciary duty that directors have to act with regard to the interests of creditors when the company's in the zone of insolvency. It doesn't really matter so much where it comes from. It is a non-statutory consideration that's repeatedly raised uh, by the regulator and keeps you on the right side of the scrutiny of courts, regulatory bodies, uh, and probably the trustees as well. Uh, the final consideration that I have is prudence. Um, prudence in investment is the topic of the third talk in this year's lectures, but my reference to it is much more mundane. I'm simply using it to refer to the need for the employer to be prudent in assessing the financial situation um, and what to do about it. Um, in a sense, it's stating the obvious to say that one should avoid making one request for a contribution break only to have to make a similar request uh, a month or two later. That easily gives the impression that the contribution break is postponing the inevitable. Um, but I do think it's relevant in the pensions context, particularly the PPF is very concerned about this idea of simply kicking the can down the road. Um, I've started with non-statutory considerations because as I say, if I'm allowed to make an argument, it's that these are very important. Um, and these talks are dedicated to the memory of the late Edward Nugie, uh, Queen's Council, who did so much for Chambers Pensions Group. And one of his cases was uh, Barclay Applegate. Um, sitting as a high court, deputy high court judge, he applied general equitable principles to an insolvency situation. Um, and it's the case that allows office holders to draw on trust property in the company's possession for remuneration and expenses. Um, so it seems appropriate to start the talk um, by noting the importance of these non-statutory considerations. Um, I think that's perhaps particularly true when dealing with pension schemes as creditors, uh, given the importance of uh, equitable considerations in pensions law. And I think it applies particularly in the current climate. Um, did you know, for example, that the Cabinet Office on the 7th of May issued guidance on responsible contractual behaviour in the performance and enforcement of contracts. Uh, and although it makes clear it's non-statutory guidance, uh, it's got a definition of what responsible behaviour is in relation to contracts uh, and uses the terms just and equitable contractual outcomes um, and parties being reasonable and proportionate in responding to performance issues. Um, and it expressly covers positions where parties can't make payments due under an agreement. Um, and since we know from Section 229 of the 2004 Act that a recovery plan and matters to be included in a schedule of contributions must be agreed between trustee and employer, we might find some room to rely on non-statutory guidance like this um, in the context of contribution breaks. And it's obviously not going to alter trustees' powers or duties, but it might help set context in discussions uh, with perhaps TPR as well. So the second area then is insolvency and associated legislation. Um, and the clunky reference to associated legislation is to the Companies Act 2006. And in particular, section 1723. Um, you'll have to slightly bear with me for the next 10 minutes. Um, it's a bit of a discourse into insolvency. Um, after you've coped with um, the Companies Act, um, there's wrongful trading, which again is going to feel slightly irrelevant, except for the notifiable event regime, which uses wrongful trading as a trigger point for notifying the regulator. Um, uh, and then finally, we cover moratoriums under the uh, new bill. Um, but I want to start with section 1723, because it's unaffected by any legislative proposals. Uh, and it is the section that provides for directors general duties to promote the success of the company for the benefit of members as a whole. Um, to, in certain circumstances, be made subject to rules that directors must consider or act in the interests of creditors. 
And the principle was recently discussed by the Court of Appeal in a case, the citations up there, um, BTI 2014 LLC against Sequana, um, which held the duty was triggered when the directors knew or should have known the company's insolvency was probable. Um, now, the codification of directors' duties in the Companies Act mainly takes the form of a prescriptive list. You've got uh, an express reference um, in section 173 to a director of the company must exercise independent judgment. Uh, 175 must avoid a situation of conflict. Um, and that's deliberate. The white paper that led to the Companies Act um, made clear what the government wanted to do was make the law more certain and accessible and enable the duties to be more widely known and understood. But by contrast, what happens when insolvency intrudes um, is simply referred to in the Act by a statement uh, that the duty imposed to act in the best interests of members or to promote the success of the company for benefit of members um, has effect subject to any enactment or rule of law requiring directors in certain circumstances to consider or act in the interests of creditors. Um, and so two huge questions are unanswered. Firstly, in what circumstances will that duty arise? And secondly, what is the director required to do to comply with it? Um, and in particular, are creditors' interests paramount? Um, well, Sequana, as matters stand, is the answer to certainly the first and some over to guidance on the second. I say as matters stand, one of the ironies of the current situation is that it, it was decided by the Court of Appeal. It was due to be heard by the Supreme Court, permission granted, it was due to be heard on the 25th of March this year, um, but the hearing adjourned due to the pandemic. So we've got a bit, a bit more uncertainty uh, about both these two key questions. But as matters stand, um, the duty will arise when directors knew or should have known that the company is or is likely to become insolvent, and the word likely is said by the Court of Appeal to mean probable. Um, the key point is the duty can arise before the company enters into an insolvency process, which makes some sense. Sorry. Um, which makes some sense because it's at that point that directors still have their powers over assets, um, but it's the creditors that the courts consider are prospectively entitled to those assets, not the members. The challenge though, uh, is to describe that point. When, when is it that the duty switches to consider the interests of creditors? And in Sequana, the Court of Appeal noted a wide range of descriptions in the case law. Um, there's reference to the verge of insolvency, reference to a situation of nearing insolvency, approaching insolvency, a real risk of insolvency. Um, and one slightly reminded of Lord Newberger in Nortel um, when he was describing the uh, risk of FSDs being issued. You may remember he talks about companies and Nortel and Lehman, uh, obviously, being at the one end in the sunlight, free of the FSD regime. And then you move into the penumbra of the regime. And then you move into the shadow of an FSD and finally the full darkness of a CN. Um, and there's a sort of similar sense of, well, how close do we have to be to insolvency before this duty to have regard to directors, uh, to creditors' interests intrudes? Well, as I say, at the, at the moment, um, the court's uh, position is that it's when insolvency is considered by the directors or ought to be considered as probable. Um, and one link to that, um, the content of the duty doesn't vary according to the degree of the risk of insolvency. Um, second question was how to comply with it. Um, well, as matters stand, the court's clear preference is to treat interests of creditors as paramount. Um, but what I've said on the slide is importantly, it's a subjective test. Um, the starting point has to be that the directors have regard to creditors' interests. You can fall foul of this duty by simply not considering either interests of creditors at all uh, or unreasonably overlooking the interests of one major creditor. But assuming you turn your mind to the issue, then it's a subjective test um, to, uh, to, to fall foul of it by what you do thereafter. So we're focused on contribution breaks here, 
in my view, it's sensible to proceed on the basis that if a company needs to ask the scheme for payment holidays, the creditor's interest duty may well be engaged, uh, fact specific, but it may well be, and it then becomes very important to have regard to the interests of all creditors, be able to show the directors have done so, uh, even if the result of having done so is a decision to continue trading, try and reach agreements with certain key creditors or sources of new money. Uh, finally, a warning at the bottom of the slide, when dealing with corporate groups, it's quite easy to focus on the interests of simply the creditors of the group uh, and even the financial circumstances of the group rather than the specific situation of, sp of separate group entities. Uh, wrongful trading, um, this is relevant for us as pensions lawyers because one of the events the employers must notify to TPR under the Notifiable Events Regime is the employer receiving advice that it's trading wrongfully uh, or a director or indeed a former director of the company knowing there's no reasonable prospect of avoiding liquidation. Um, and that's taken from the wrongful trading test. Um, this is pretty topical at the moment because the government announced um, very early on in the pandemic it would be suspending wrongful trading provisions uh, for three months from the 1st of March 2020. It hasn't actually done that. Uh, what the bill does is in large part remove the financial consequences of engaging in wrongful trading. But that means the notifiable event regime still applies with full force. So whereas one might have thought a simple suspension of wrongful trading means notifiable event regime is going to be affected, that's not the case. Um, wrongful trading is described in section 214 of the Insolvency Act 1986 and there's a, a further section dealing with administration but what it is looking at is a situation where a director knew or ought to have concluded there was no reasonable prospect the company would avoid liquidation or administration, uh, but the company carried on trading regardless. Uh, and in those circumstances, a liquidator or administrator can bring proceedings seeking payment from the director to the company's estate. Uh, there's a defense if the director knew or ought to have concluded there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding uh, liquidation or administration. And the director then took every step, I say every step, with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company's creditors that he ought to have done. Um, so usually two key questions in these cases, um, should the director have concluded there's no reasonable prospect of avoiding liquidation? And if so, did he thereafter take all steps he ought to have done? Um, now, those are both objective questions. Uh, so it's not surprising, it seems to me, that the government focused on this and the suspension of this provision um, due to the current pandemic, because assessing whether a company will avoid insolvency and then what ought to be done as a result are obviously extremely difficult in the current time. Um, but as I say, what's happened is not a suspension of the provisions entirely, but an, an alteration to the way in which financial compensation might be worked out. In a nutshell, the court's supposed to assume the director is not responsible for worsening the financial position of the company or its creditors between 1st of March this year and 30th of June. Um, and that, that period of 30th June could be extended. So it removes the financial consequences because normally the, the amount of contribution that a director is ordered to pay is linked to that worsening of financial position. Um, but as I say, it leaves the notifiable event regime uh, unaffected. Um, the third topic that I wanted to look at under the insolvency legislation is a new regime because in view of those two points, wrongful trading and the creditor's interest duty. Um, it seems to me that opening negotiations with the scheme for a contribution break uh, is a very sensible thing for an employer to do, stating the obvious, uh, and some can certainly be done in compliance with the director's duties um, and, and 1723. Uh, but as Simon's identified, there may be situations where the trustee can't or uh, won't agree to a contribution break and one thing to flag in that context is that the new insolvency bill is going to introduce a moratorium. Um, unlike administration, um, which has traditionally been seen as the way of companies getting a breathing space, this is not going to be, as matters stand, an insolvency event under Section 121 of the 2004 Pensions Act. So it's not going to trigger a Section 75 debt or a PPF assessment period, uh, and the trustee is going to retain voting rights 
uh, in respect of any debts due from the employer. Um, and the intention is to give a breathing space, um, assuming there's no outstanding winding up petition, assuming the company is not subject to a specialist insolvency regime, then the directors can simply file papers at court um, and they, those papers will include a statement from an insolvency practitioner who's to monitor the moratorium, that the moratorium is reasonably likely to achieve the rescue of the company as a going concern. So the purpose of the moratorium has to be survival of the company. It has to be that the company itself will continue as a going concern out of the other side. Um, but it will restrict the enforcement or payment of a category of debts described as, pause, deep breath, pre-moratorium debts for which the company has a payment holiday during a moratorium. I would like to call these holiday debts to remind me of the days when I was allowed to take a holiday but ran up a debt. Um, there are separate categories of moratorium debts, debts arise during the moratorium, uh, save those that arise due to obligations incurred beforehand. Um, and there are also pre-moratorium debts for which the company doesn't have a payment holiday. Um, for example, rent for a period during the moratorium and wages or salary arising under a contract of employment. Now, contributions to a pension scheme, uh, it seems to, me, seems to me unpaid contributions under a schedule of contributions are going to be pre-moratorium debts and the company will have a payment holiday in respect of them. There's sometimes some arguments that the phrase wages or salary includes pension contributions because pensions are so often referred to as deferred pay. Uh, and in the bill, wages or salary is defined as including a contribution to an occupational pension scheme. Um, but it seems to me pretty clear that's a reference to amounts the employer deducts from wages in order to pay the scheme's employee contributions. Um, the moratorium prevents steps to place a company into an insolvency process, prevents legal process against the company, and prevents enforcement action by creditor creditors such as the trustees trying to enforce. And as I say, the starting point is it lasts for 20 business days. The directors can extend it for another 20 business days. And then with either creditor consent or the court, it could be extended up to 12 months. So it's potentially a, a very useful tool to give time to restructure, refinance, uh, and hopefully come out the other side. Uh, that's everything on insolvency. Um, the pensions legislation, well, um, I've mentioned the notifiable event concerning wrongful trading. Uh, one needs to be aware of the possibility of other notifiable events in this scenario of contribution breaks. Um, is a decision to request such a break, a decision to take action which will result in a debt um, which is or may become due to the scheme not being paid in full? Well, presumably not if you're deferring. Um, if you're asking to write off, then maybe. Um, and separately note the pension schemes bill. Um, we're told it's still a priority of the DWP to get this through Parliament. It's apparently being delayed while the House of Lords works out voting processes. Um, but of course that brings even criminal offences of conduct caught by the existing material detriment test and new contribution notice powers as well. Um, I'm going to quickly skip through the TPR guidance because you've heard it from Francesca and Simon. The point I wanted to pick up really was C, fair treatment of the scheme, um, because TPR makes clear contribution breaks may be appropriate, flags the provision of information point uh, that I've mentioned, uh, nicely identifies at the bottom that we will be pragmatic in scenarios where trustees are being asked to agree a previously unforeseen arrangement, and I'm resisting the urge to say anything about what that says about pragmatic in other circumstances, um, but picking up C and fair treatment, and this is really my last uh, point, um, what does it mean to talk about fair treatment of a scheme? Well, um, the, the courts have recognized in the context of CVAs that treating creditors differently may indeed be necessary to achieve fairness. It can certainly sometimes be justified. Um, and to take an example that you see in one of the CBAs, um, barring all creditors from suing a company, treating them all equally, may actually be unfair on those who only want to sue so that they can then claim on an insurance policy. So it may be that differential treatment is necessary to achieve fairness. Um, certainly, you can justify paying some creditors in full to ensure business continuity. Um, the court has accepted that it's not the sign of unfair prejudice 
to other creditors um, per se um, to be treating them differently. And uh, there's a matter of perception. Uh, in the recent Debenhams challenge to, the CV to its CBA at the end of last year, um, the court recognized that there was a perception difference between paying and proposing to pay long-term landlords differently from those suppliers who, who, whose orders arrive um, and whose orders need to be paid uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the scheme isn't in that category. Um, and for a start, it might well be susceptible to mitigation that other creditors can't be offered. Um, as I said right at the beginning, there may well be reasons that justify treating the scheme differently in terms of business continuity. Um, the important points for me, I think, in this circumstance, and one needs to be careful, um, but they're back to the non-statutory considerations. Um, being transparent and prudent, being able to justify any departure from the principle that equality is equity. Um, and with that, I'm going to hope that we can soon start talking about holiday debts again. And I'm going to pass you back to James. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Tom. I think we've got time for one question um, and I'll read it out. <clears throat> Do you think that trustees should be more cautious about agreeing to defer deficit recovery contributions in light of the proposed changes to the insolvency laws, which could further reduce the amount that DB schemes stand to recover in an insolvency after deployment of the moratorium? I'm going to see if I can find the question written out because I'm told I can do that as well, and that will help. Um, okay, I think I've found it. Thank you, Tim. Um, I think the starting point is probably yes, and when in doubt, give a short answer. Um, there are, I mean, for a start, the new bill is not yet on the statute book, and the House of Lords has already said that it's um, quite interested, um, and, and there's quite a lot of industry pressure for um, it to be looked at quite carefully. Um, no one, as far as I am aware, um, has really looked at the interplay between this and the pension schemes bill, um, which are pointing in rather different directions. Um, so I think, as I say, when in doubt, give a short answer. Should the trustees be more cautious? Well, yes, uh, which may be one of the reasons why um, one does want to negotiate with trustees, but recognise there's a line beyond which they can't go. Very good. Uh, we have received a number of questions which we've not responded to live. Those that came with a name will be in touch. Those that were anonymous, please email us um, and then we'll be uh, following up with your question and we'll of course be very happy to respond. Um, I think we've now uh, reached the point where it's time to, to wrap up. Thanks again very much to Tom, Simon and Francesca. Uh, uh, not just for this, the, the fantastic presentations, but also because of the papers that will be coming out in due course uh, and provided to uh, all those who signed up. Um, let me just take very briefly the opportunity to remind you that there are three more lectures in this series. On Tuesday, the 16th of June, James McCreth and Jonathan Chu will be talking about rectification. On Wednesday, the 24th of June, David Pollard and M. Scott Donald from the University of New South Wales will talk about prudence in investment and dealing with extreme risks. And on Tuesday, the 30th of June, Michael Furness QC, Robert Ham QC and Jonathan Davy QC will be talking about tax. I understand that invitations for next week's lecture went out yesterday and invitations for the remaining talks will go out a week or so before they take place. So please look out for those and, and do sign up. Uh, and with that, let me thank again uh, the speakers and also thank you all for joining us. <laughs>